markets. But let's start, before we start talking about those shorter-term time horizons, by trying to frame the outlook for two, uh, for over the next five years. This confusing chart here um, is a chart showing previous secular bear markets in the US um, over the last uh, century or so. There are four major bear markets. What I'd like you to focus in on is the blue line. Um, and the blue line basically shows where we are now, which is uh, 12 and a half years into a secular bear market in equities. If you look historically, purely on a statistical basis, you would expect around about now, if history were a guide, you'd be transitioning from that secular bear to that secular bull. So purely statistically, if you look at where you are now, as opposed to where you might be tomorrow, the future would look pretty auspicious. The problem is, the missing part of the jigsaw, as I talked about earlier on, is what's happened in terms of the levels of interest rates. This is a long-term chart of the US bond market, and it shows how since 1982, interest rates have almost been on a steadily declining trend. And it shows that the real government bond yield now, you have to go back to the late 70s, or really back to the time of the Second World War, to find a period where interest rates have been negative on a sustained basis for as long as they have um, recently. So the big question, therefore, is what actually happens when this 10-year government bond yield is actually goes into reverse? That is the key investment question. <coughs> Another way of expressing that is to say, what actually happens when you go from an environment which is a deflationary environment to something which is normal, normal, normal? Because the next question to ask yourself is, well, what is going to cause that normalization of interest rates? It could be higher inflation, in which case, Lord help us. It could be higher economic growth, which would be quite a good outcome. In actual fact, if you look at from 2000 to 2008, whenever real bond yields rose, the equity markets rallied. Why? Because interest rates were rising for real reasons, not because of inflation expectations. So the big issue here is how do you manage through this period of the normalization of interest rates? And this is now becoming an urgent question. Because six months ago, if you talked about interest rate normalization, and I did, people look, would look at you as if you're stark staring mad. Okay? The fact that I w I'm stark staring mad had nothing to do with the fact, of course. But the fact remains that when interest rates normalize, historically, it has always been a very uncomfortable time for risk assets. We had a look at data going back to 1870. And every time there was a change in direction in the bond markets, the first year of that change in direction in the bond markets, you lost money on almost everything, without exception. The only two minor exceptions were in 1900 and 1940, and both the times, the reason for that was soft commodity prices did something unexpected. But in almost every other instance, you lose money. Now, what is the chances of interest rates normalizing? Well, if you look at uh, this chart here, what this basically says is we've, we've derived what the market expects to happen in terms of the Fed funds rate. And what the market is saying, based on current expectations, is that interest, the Fed funds rate, um, in real terms, will only be zero by 2020 will remain negative between now and 2020. Look at that chart long and hard. If you believe that, uh, I fear for everybody's future in this room. Because that will be basically saying we will be in a sustained period of deflation. And the returns on risk assets will be even worse than they've been over the last decade. So I think you have to have a working assumption that you, unless you have an Armageddon type of scenario, that you are going to have a normalization of interest rates. And I think this very dramatically illustrates just how out of line with reality the markets are right now. I know that's a loaded value judgment, just how far out of line markets are. But if there's one thing we should have learned over the last decade or so is markets are not rational. 
If markets were rational, 2008 would not have happened, full stop. So I can hope we can dispose with that, period, uh, that piece of, of ideological assumption. Punchline, therefore. The one to five year view of the world. How do you manage and how do you transition from a deflationary environment to something which is no normal? That will be the test of investment skill. That will be how you make your alpha. Within that context, then, what is the outlook over the shorter time frame? What's the outlook over the next uh, 12 months or so, which is what I've been really asked to talk about? My key point here is I think the best performer on a relative basis will be the emerging markets. Why? Because when we look at the short-term time frame, we look at three essential points. How much value is there embedded in assets? How much liquidity is available? And what is the growth outlook? And when I look at value, China ticks the box. When I look at liquidity, China ticks the box. And when I look at growth on the basis of recent economic data, which has come out of China, China ticks the box. But when I look at stock markets overall, we only have one or two ticks in the box. So for example, in terms of the BCA global value indicator, markets are around about fair value, not outstanding value. Some people sort of say to me, but hang on a second, the equity risk premium is really high. If you'd invest on equity risk premiums, you wouldn't be sitting in this room. The equity risk premium was negative back in 1982, and that preceded 18 years of a major secular bull market. But looking at the range of valuation indicators, uh, going back based on history of over 100 years, we can actually see that we're around about fair value, nothing outstanding there. When we look at the second component, we look at liquidity, we can see that the liquidity environment is incredibly auspicious. Uh, central banks have expanded their balance sheets two or three times since 2008. But the point I'm making here, I think, is a very simple one. It is that, by definition, expanding your balance sheet does not create wealth. We all intuitively know that printing money doesn't create wealth. And yet, wherever I go, I'm asked the question, since March of 2009, equity markets have more than doubled, but I can't persuade my clients to invest in equities. I think the answer is pretty self-obvious, because your clients know that that is not real. One stage further, we did some work recently. I'd be happy to send this research to anybody. Um, with the exception of the initial QE, in March of uh, 2009, or early 2009, any country which has tended to do QE, yes, the equity market has risen, but their equity market in common currency terms has tended to underperform. Well, basically, what you're saying there is that what expanding a central bank balance sheet does is it manages the tail risk. It puts a floor under equity prices. It doesn't alter the central tendency of the economy. And therefore, the only way in which QE can actually be good for equity markets is managing that tail risk or altering the central tendency of economic activity. And there's absolutely no evidence that the central tendency of economic activity has been altered by QE. In actual fact, look at the United Kingdom. The UK has had the biggest expansion in its balance sheet. But surprise, surprise, the economy is almost skirted with recession consistently. Why? Because what matters in the current environment is not monetary policy, it is fiscal policy. Why? Because in normal cycles, bull markets end when monetary policy tightens. Why does monetary policy tighten? Monetary policy tightens because of excesses in the private sector. There are no excesses in the private sector right now. The excesses are in the public sector, and that is a function of fiscal policy. So the key thing to focus in on is fiscal policy. It is going to be fiscal policy which is going to shape the environment over the course of 2013.
the most bullish thing which could happen would be the abandonment of austerity. If austerity is abandoned over the next 12 months, don't think twice, start buying risk assets, you'll make a whole load of money. Because you cannot influence the central tendency of economic activity by monetary policy, you can do it by fiscal policy. So what's missing, essentially, is that if you look at this chart here, this is just US real GDP on a five-year moving average uh, as a proxy for global GDP. What you really need to happen to be confident about the outlook for equities is you need to turn this around, and you need to see increased growth momentum. Now, there is an argument which basically says in the US, um, because of all the uncertainties being lifted now, um, people are going to start investing again. Bear in mind what drives economies is not consumption expenditure, it's investment spending. And the argument has been that because of all the uncertainty which has been around, people haven't been investing. And now that uncertainty has been lifted, and people are going to start investing again. Not so fast. If you look at the small company surveys, the NFIB surveys, for example, those clearly show the three major concerns are lack of sales, regulation, and taxes. Guess what? There's not going to be less regulation. Uh, even Governor Romney in that first US electoral debate sort of said, I'm in favor of regulation, just sensible regulation. I don't know what the definition of sensible regulation is. But there's now a bipartisan agreement that regulation um, is a, a real part of economic life. Secondly, taxes ain't coming down. They're just going to remain the same. Um, so just based on those surveys, nothing has really changed in the US. You avoid falling over a cliff, but growth is probably this year going to be pretty much what it was um, last year. And there is a problem, because there's one element of the US debate which hasn't yet been resolved, and that is, as far as the debt ceiling is concerned, you're going to need to cut some of the discretionary spending. And guess what? If you have a look at the household savings rate in the United States, the household savings rate, yes, has been improving and has begun to roll over again. But the more interesting chart is if you look at what happens to household savings rate adjusted for government net social benefits. And there you find that that gap is getting bigger and bigger. So what are you saying? You're not saying that the household sector has been saving more. You'd be saying the government sector is saving less. So what actually happens when they agree to cut transfer payments? It will force an adjustment on the private sector. So this whole debate is not yet over. It's still in play. And that's the big uncertainty which I see in 2013. And the source of that uncertainty is in the US. The source of uncertainty last year was in China, and that's reversing this year. And you can see that in terms of uh, this chart here. Um, the one I'm particularly interested in, the high frequency data in China. I don't trust the GDP numbers. It's the only society on Earth which knows what GDP is going to be before the end of the year. Um, and but basically what this shows is some of the higher frequency data has begun to improve. So at the time when the economic uncertainties in the United States have increased, the economic uncertainties in China are diminishing. So the observation would be the environment for emerging market equities in terms of that value liquidity growth framework are improving. The other area which I think is actually going to show some sign of improvement is the Eurozone. And people will sort of say, what? But the economic activity in the Eurozone is not going to pick up. Don't worry. If you try and correlate Eurozone economic activity with the relative performance of its equity market, it doesn't work, full stop. What matters for the Eurozone, because it's driven so much by exports, is external growth and emerging markets growth. And if that picks up, historically, Europe has done better. There's another reason why Europe should actually do better. If you have a look at the euro area earnings growth versus global earnings growth, it is lagged behind everywhere uh, everybody else. It has begun to improve, however, and therefore the call on the emerging markets and the call on the eurozone, I think, is one and the same thing. I'll be very quick to add, I would not include euro banks in this basket. European banks in aggregate are technically bust. If you look at the tangible equity to total assets ratio of German and French banks, for example, it's about 2%, or one-third of what it is in the United States. 
We have a historical example for this back in the 1990s. The problems for the US banks was over, were over by around the middle of the decade. The problems for the banks in Europe lingered to the end of the decade. And the history is mixed. But the rest of the market, and particularly the external side of the market, should actually do reasonably well this year. So how does this translate into sort of uh, what we feel is going to be a broadly appropriate investment portfolio uh, for the next 12 months? Well, we run two portfolios. One is a modern um, medium risk portfolio where we're neutral in equities, but within our equity portfolio, we have a, a high element of embedded beta. So we're overweight in the emerging markets um, and we are overweight in the Eurozone. Uh, but to try and finish on a positive note, I'd like to try and show you our higher risk portfolio, um, which I think would reflect more accurately the way a Norwegian would feel about the world. I always uh, imagine you guys to be slightly more optimistic, at least for certain points of the cycle, uh, than the rest of the world, particularly when oil prices are elevated. And then we're basically to say that sort of based on the three to 12 month year of the world, we would be overweight in equities, um, we would be underweight in the US, we'd be uh, overweight in the emerging markets, and we'd be overweight in Europe. The thing which sticks out like a sore thumb on this is what the weighting we've got on Japan. And um, over the last two to three weeks, three weeks, wherever I've gone, people have said, well, what about Japan? And that's a very relevant question, I guess, from the perspective of a Norwegian investor. But you'll be quick to say to me, but our equity market is correlated with emerging market equity markets. And if I am taking more risk in emerging markets, I've already got enough risk even through being invested in uh, Norwegian equities. Therefore, should I be uh, making and doubling that bet and adding to the beta? So wouldn't Japanese equities fill the bill? And that's a, that's, a, that's a very reasonable question to pose. Let me put it to you this way. The Japanese equity market has been in a secular bear market for 22 years. But there have been three counter-trend rallies in the Japanese equity market, three counter-trend rallies in the Japanese equity market of more than 50%. And one of those was more than 100% between 2003 and 2007. So the first question to ask is, given the new government and given the commitment to be more aggressive in the expansion of the Bank of Japan balance sheet, does this represent a potential counter-trend move within the secular bear market? Or is this the beginning of the reversal of that long-term bear market in Japan? For now, it probably doesn't matter, right? if your investment time horizon is three to six months. From the perspective of a Norwegian investor and from a Norwegian investor alone, I would say that you probably could maybe reduce some of that exposure in Europe and the emerging markets and put it in Japan and be a little bit more aggressive than we've been. Because the correlational, the, 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 the diversification benefits from your particular perspective, from your base, means that makes a lot more sense. I would also suggest to you that the reason why Japan has performed so poorly is Japan has been a value trap. In terms of that original framework I laid out of value, liquidity, and economic growth, the value has been there, the liquidity has been there, the economic momentum has been lacking. In the current environment, where there is the search for yield, does it matter that that economic momentum is lacking? Or will Japan become part of that search for yield. Look what happened in the European equity markets towards the end of last year. Huge regulatory risk in telecoms. No earnings growth in telecoms. But the dividend yield on European telecom stocks is higher than the corporate bond yield. People were therefore attracted into telecommunication stocks purely based on a snapshot approach of a high dividend yield. So whether or not growth comes through in Japan I would expect that there is a case to be made for buying Japanese equities purely on the basis that people are kind of be searching for that yield. If you are a growth investor, then I think it's a little bit more difficult to make a case for Japan. Why? Quite simply because 
the Japanese government is sort of saying we're going to expand the balance sheet, our balance sheet faster. Uh, and we have a target for that. Well, if they have a target for expanding their balance sheet, interest rates and the exchange rate are just a residual of that. And you have to ask yourself the question, can the Japanese actually expand their balance sheet faster than the Fed's balance sheet or the ECB balance sheet? And that's a legitimate question. The second thing which is essential in terms of generating an economic recovery in Japan is that China comes into play. So if you have two things happening, if you have QE weakening the yen and you have China recovering, then there is a growth case as well as a value case for Japan. But I think you need those two other elements to fall into place. Otherwise, you're investing purely on the search for yield. And finishing on the search for yield, I started by, in terms of my three observations, by basically saying that we were in an interest rate bubble. I think that interest rate bubble has further to go. And now I'm going to make a very brave forecast. And please turn off all those microphones. I think before this cycle is over, the interest rate on investment grade corporate debt across a wide range of sectors and for a wide range of companies will be lower than the interest rate on sovereign debt. Well, people will say, well, that, that's crazy. You know, you go back to 2007, for example. I remember it was in New York at the time. And the kind of um, basic observation then of one client was, look at AIG debt. It was trading two basis points over, over Treasury. It doesn't make any sense. And he was right. But the balance sheet of AIG was lousy. But think now, the balance sheet of the corporate sector with a net free cash flow position as the strongest it's been for a couple of decades actually looks a lot better um, than the balance sheet of the government. This is the BCA uh, corporate health monitor, and it shows uh, that although the situation has deteriorated, the corporate sector is still in improving health. Therefore, why shouldn't those rates be lower? What is the new riskless asset? Haven't we learnt that the concept of a risk of asset is an oxymoron? If something is an asset, it is not riskless by definition, particularly when the government is trying to debase the currency. So I think that kind of there is still more to go for in terms of the corporate debt markets. Um, yes, it's a bubble, but I repeat again, the greater fool theory applies equally to those who sell too early as those who sell too late. Now, I started with a little story from Animal Farm about how kind of event lost and the farmer took over again, was that the animals were not able to establish institutions which were inclusive institutions and which represented all animals. Remember, it were muted from four legs good, two legs bad, to all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, and the pigs were on the top of the totem pole. And the moral of that story was that Animals were not able to establish effective government. And therefore, I'm going to completely confuse you and sort of say that while I am advocating that you should be more bullish about the outlook for emerging markets in the short term, I think if you take a five-year view of the world, developed markets will do much better than emerging markets because there are a set of economic problems out there which will be very challenging for everybody. Take China, for example. The economy has grown seven times since 1989. There's been no real political development. How do you resolve that? You know, when you try and square that circle, Korea did it late 80s, early 90s, the result was a severe amount of social and economic turbulence. And I think there's a good chance that China will go through that as well over the next five years or so. The one-child family has obviously made left a lousy demographics of China in the middle of this decade onwards. Uh, never mind the fact that Chinese growth is driven by the CAPEX cycle, and when the CAPEX cycle rolls over and interest rates normalize, Asia is the warrant on the normalization of interest rates. I repeat, Asia is the warrant on the normalization of interest rates. The one place you do not want to be when U.S. interest rates start normalizing, and trust me, is Asia. The Krugman thesis, which basically says the illusion of productivity growth in Asia in the 1990s was not a reflection of increased 
well, well, of increased productivity. It was a reflection of excess capital spending, as been repeated all over again. The only difference between China and Asia then is that China has more massive foreign exchange reserves and it's running a current account surplus, except that current account surplus is now beginning to come down. So I'd like to leave you with this, following, this thought. If you have a one to five year view on the world, it seems to me that the outlook for risk assets is very good, but you want to be in a longer term basis as opposed to a shorter term basis, particularly from a Norwegian perspective where you are so correlated with, with the future of emerging markets. You want to be involved more with developed markets rather than with developing markets. And remember this, Ms. Peter's Law, if you're not confused today, you're simple not thinking clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, we open for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, for your speech. Da gjenstår det bare for meg å ønske alle vel hjem. Tusen takk for oppmøtet og velkommen tilbake til nyttårskonferansen 2014.